So now that we've looked at how muscles work within the body, specifically skeletal muscles and the roles of cardiac and smooth muscle, we're going to shift gears and now look at the skeleton because this lecture is entitled Musculoskeletal System. They both work hand in hand to give us the functions that are associated with both. So let's begin by entitling the next flowchart, Skeleton 1. And the first thing that we'll do is understand the three basic functions of any skeleton. So. A skeleton is useful for and allows for the following three functions. They are the idea of support. Skeletons will support the organism. They will also be involved in the protection of the organism. And they will also be, of course, involved in the movement of the organism. And the movement is highly associated with the specific muscles. And the movement, um, the examples of this are shown in figure 50.34, how a skeleton can be useful for movement. In terms of protection, a skeleton is basically going to protect the interior of an organism. The squishy organs that are um, subject to the harsh environment can be protected um, by some sort of exterior or maybe semi-exterior skeleton, as we'll see. And also in terms of support, basically without a skeleton, our bodies would just sag. They would float in midair or just go to the ground. With support, we allow our bodies via a skeleton to be upright, to be capable of movement. So support and movement are very much hand in hand. Protection is mainly of interior goods. So those are our three major functions of a skeleton. Those will be highlighted as we go through the three types of skeletons that are worth notice. So there are three types that are seen in most organisms and they are as follows. So let's do hydrostatic skeleton first. This is the first one that we'll cover. It's called a hydrostatic skeleton. So here, what we have is a non-hard skeleton, okay? Hydrostatic skeletons are, generally speaking, soft skeletons, and these are going to be skeletons that are fluid-filled for that reason. These are fluid-filled skeletons. And what is the purpose of this? When you have a fluid-filled skeleton, what you've created is a closed compartment. You've created something as some sort of organism, whichever one that has a hydroskeleton, has a closed compartment that doesn't let fluid out. Okay, closed compartment doesn't let any of the interior fluid out. And when you have fluid enclosed in some sort of compartment, what you create is some sort of pressure. So what we state is that the fluid that's enclosed in a hydrostatic skeleton is under pressure. Think of a water balloon. A water balloon is under pressure because the outside of it, basically the hydrostatic skeleton, is going to be uh, sustaining this pressure caused by the water that's encompassed within it because the water balloon itself is a closed compartment that for the most part doesn't let any fluid out so long as it's tied correctly. Same idea with fluid-filled hydrostatic skeletons. They're constantly under pressure. This is going to be useful because when you have this pressure that's inherent to a hydrostatic skeleton, it allows for an event of movement called peristalsis. It allows for this to occur. And peristalsis is simply speaking movement, but it's specifically going to be via rhythmic muscle contractions. So this is why skeleton and muscle is very much associated with each other. When you have very specific and rhythmic muscle contractions, you are going to allow this hydrostatic skeleton possessing organism to undergo peristalsis. This is shown in figure 50.35. So I think a good way to understand the purpose or the example of a hydroskeleton is to look at it in nature. When do you see a hydrostatic skeleton and how is it useful? Most of the time, you're going to see this non-hard skeleton in what are known as soft-bodied invertebrates. So soft-bodied inverts, for short, are going to possess hydrostatic skeletons. These are things like cnidarians, which are just very, very soft organisms, things like nematodes, all from animal diversity, nematodes and annelids are another example. Um, just three sort of general groups of organisms that have hydrostatic skeletons, but the one you want to be aware of is a hydra. So a hydra is a cnidarian, and a hydra is going to be an organism that has two layers of what are considered 
antagonistic. They go against each other. They fight against each other, but within each other. Two layers of antagonistic contractile. So contractile simply means things that promote contraction or movement. Contractile cells. And the hydra itself will possess a hydrostatic skeleton that is, uh, that is going to respond to the antagonistic contractile cells. How so? Well, what we have in the hydra are the following. You have an outer part of it that has contractile cells. Those outer contractile cells are considered longitudinal. Longitudinal. And then there's also going to be the outer, with the opposite, the antagonist to this would be the inner contractile cells. And these are circular. So when these contract, the longitudinal outer contractile cells, the hydrostatic skeleton is going to shorten. Or because of shortening, it will basically cause widening as well, simultaneously. Whereas the inner circular contractile cells of a hydra are going to cause this to antagonistically not shorten, but allow the organism to get thinner or slash taller. Should have switched those, but taller versus shorter, thinner versus wider. That's what we see in the hydra because it is a fluid-filled skeleton that's under pressure that via peristalsis is allowed to move. If you have this movement where you go from thin to wide, from short to tall, you're going to have this antagonistic relationship that's forming that's going to be going against each other and cause contraction in the form of peristalsis, rhythmic. So you go thin, thick, thin, thick, or you go short, tall, short, tall, whatever it may be, that's the rhythm that's going to allow for figure 30.35 to occur in something like a hydra. So that's our hydrostatic skeleton. And then the other type of skeleton that I'll cover here is the exoskeleton, something we should be pretty familiar with. We've mentioned exoskeleton before. This is just a skeleton that is, of course, external to an organism. This is actually going to be interesting because this is a skeleton that's comprised of non-living, non-living. It is comprised of non-living tissue. So the cells that are going to be uh, a part of this organism, those cells will not be part of the exoskeleton. Why is that? Because cells are living things. Things on the outside of this organism, on its external exterior, let's say, are non-living tissue. So. What is this non-living tissue? This is going to be usually something that is produced by epidermal cells, cells that are on the outside of the organism that can then secrete something, and that's going to allow for an exoskeleton to form. Because these are non-living and exoskeletons, these exoskeletons in themselves exhibit no growth. The exoskeleton never grows. The organism itself may grow and shed the exoskeleton, via a process known as molting, but the skeleton itself will not grow. So there will be molting via a specific process, I should say, that's called ecdysis. Remember, that's what some organisms do if they have an exoskeleton. Because the exoskeleton itself doesn't grow, the organism does grow, so you have to molt and get rid of the exoskeleton via ecdysis and then secrete a new larger exoskeleton as a result of your interior uh, internal growth. A good example of this is seen in the animal world. Um, for example, arthropods, like insects, let's say, all insects are arthropods. They will have a chitin exoskeleton. Chitin exoskeleton. And maybe, let's say, another type of organism. Let's say the mollusks. These mollusks will have a calcium carbonate, CaCO3 exoskeleton. The chitin exoskeleton is going to provide, of course, protection. And that's, of course, one of the things that a skeleton does over here. And it also is going to be useful in transmitting force. And that's basically going to be a fancy way of saying in movement, in flying, let's say, because insects like to fly. The calcium carbonate exoskeleton is going to be something that's secreted by the mantle. Let's not forget that. Secreted by that mantle structure in mollusks and it's also going to be useful in protection of this organism. Not so much in movement, but mainly in protection. So that covers our look at the hydrostatic skeleton, the exoskeleton. In the next video, we'll look at the endoskeleton, which is worth noting because this is what you and I have.